Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Greyfriars Kirk. I'm Richard Fraser. I'm minister here at Greyfriars, and I'm standing in for George White, the presbytery, presbytery, principal clerk. Sorry, I've done him a disservice. Um, George has gone to Caithness, but he'll be able to tune in tonight to the lecture, no doubt, if he's online somewhere in Thurso or John O'Groats. Um, this, is, this has been a really stimulating couple of weeks for us and for all of us who've been part of these Chalmers lectures and then today part of the, uh, the Heart Edge conference, which will continue tomorrow. Can I just say a couple of things about tonight's plan? Because um, we're going to have a, a dinner here, a sort of um, fork supper, sometimes people call it, provided by the Grass Market Community Project. And then we're going to have a, a Cayley. So at the end of the lecture, there will be a, a short hiatus when we'll move some chairs. We've got a fantastic team at Greyfires who do that kind of thing almost daily and they'll set up some chairs and tables at, at the far end of the church. And then at about half past seven, supper will be served and then they'll be dancing. Um, probably not till the wee small hours, but for as long as people want to do it. So that's the arrangements for tonight. There'll be some drinks available between um, the end of the lecture and the conversation and then supper being served. Um, there's an exhibition going on in London at the moment that I'm sure some of us have heard a fair bit about um, by uh, the artist Anthony Gormley. And he's an extraordinary guy and I'm really excited about going down to London to see it, although I'm slightly nervous about the crowds that will be in the National Gallery. Um, one, one of the things that, that Anthony Gormley has talked about that I find really engaging is this idea of his approach to art where he talks about engaging with the total experience of people. He talks about how art in the past has often been representational, but photography and film has given us that opportunity to, to kind of engage with the visual world much more readily. And so he's so much more of a kind of abstract person, but he also deals with the human body. And I'm just so excited to see this exhibition. But one of the things that he talks about is art engaging with the whole person. And I think that that's what Heart Edge and what these lectures, the Chalmers lectures, and what Sam's whole approach for me uh, has been so exciting. Anthony Gormley said uh, that he's talking about art here, but I think Sam's approach to the church is that it can be, um, now what's the, the quote here that I've got? Can the church be what Anthony Gormley describes as an acupuncture in our daily lives. <laughs> I like that image. And I kind of think of Sam Wells as the Anthony Gormley of the church. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure, honor, and privilege to welcome him here to Greyfriars. And we look forward to your lecture tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Richard, and thank you for that warm, uh, warm applause. It's always nice to have warm applause at the beginning because you never know what's going to come at the end. Uh, thank you again to the committee who invited me and gave me the privilege of giving these Chalmers lectures. Uh, it has come to my attention that there are people who have not either been present for or watched loyally all four of the previous lectures. There are such people in the world, so just for your sake, uh, in the first lecture, I gave an overview of our social and political situation. Uh, in the second lecture, I talked about the significance of money. Uh, and in the subsequent, the last four lectures, I'm talking about what at Heart Edge we call the four Cs. So in the third lecture, I talked about commerce. Uh, last night, I talked about compassion or charity. And tonight, I'm going to be talking about culture. And if you want to know about congregational life, you need to come back tomorrow. So, culture tonight, making our hearts sing, let all the people praise thee. Let us pray. God of grace, if I love thee, for hope of heaven, then deny me heaven. 
If I love thee for fear of hell, then give me hell. But if I love thee for thyself alone, then give me thyself alone. Amen. So tonight I'm going to explore two understandings of the term culture. And uh, one is general and one is specific. I'm going to propose that a renewed approach to the more specific understanding may lead to a healthy form of the more general understanding. And I'm going to conclude with a humble example of what culture can mean in renewing a congregation. The two understandings to which I'm referring are, on the one hand, a sense of culture as all-pervading, a kind of adverb to the verb of human existence, and on the other hand, a perception of culture as specifically associated with artifacts of achievement in the field of the arts and the different, more refined and aspirational world they depict. I'm going to start with culture in general. For H. Richard Niebuhr, culture is the artificial secondary environment in which humankind superimposes on the natural. It comprises language, habits, ideas, beliefs, customs, social organization, inherited artifacts, technical processes, and values. This world of culture, humankind's achievement, exists within the world of grace, God's kingdom. This anthropological understanding of culture is always social, never private. Likewise, social life is always cultural. Culture is human achievement. It's the designed and laborious work of humankind's mind and hands. Culture is not non-human efforts or actions of humans without intention of results or control of the process. It includes speech, education, tradition, myth, science, art, philosophy, government, law, right, beliefs, inventions, technologies. No one can possess it without their own effort and achievement. It concerns what people have purposely wrought and can or ought to do. Culture refers to the made and intended world. It is a world of values because people make and do things for a purpose and design them to serve a good, in most cases a human good. What is thought of as good is what is good for humanity, although not always only humanity. There is no nature that can be known apart from culture. Niebuhr draws no explicit line between culture and what we might call high culture, between the inevitable way humans adopt, adapt, and digest the natural world and the ways they seek to identify, articulate, and portray its most salient features. Whether material or immaterial, culture requires human goods to be realized in temporal and material form. This is what he says. The harmony and proportion, the form, order, and rhythm, the meanings and ideas that people intuit and trace out as they confront nature, social events, and the world of dreams, these, by infinite labor, they must paint on wall or canvas, print on paper as systems of philosophy or science, outline in carved stone or cast in bronze, sing in ballad, ode, or symphony. Visions of order and justice, hopes of glory, must, at the cost of much suffering, be embodied in written laws, dramatic rights, structures of government, empires, ascetic lives. For upholders of culture, conservation of values is as much a concern as their realization. Buildings decay, the jungle and desert encroach, law, art, learning, religion, and morality cannot be maintained like buildings, but have to be written on the hearts of each new generation. Threats to such values come more from criticism and revolution than from natural forces. Culture is finally plural and diverse. All societies are always involved in laborious efforts to hold together in tolerable conflict the efforts of diverse people and groups to achieve and conserve many goods. Such cultures 
are forever seeking to combine peace with prosperity, justice with order, freedom with welfare, truth with beauty, scientific truth with moral good, technical proficiency with practical wisdom, holiness with life, and all these with the rest. One highly influential application of these more general observations is the management guru Peter Drucker's much quoted but nowhere recorded remark, culture eats strategy for breakfast. The insight doesn't seek to denigrate strategy, but to contrast a generic imposed method with an authentic, unique, and owned culture, and to recognize that if your organization's culture doesn't align with the leadership strategy, the culture will always win. It has become a mantra for management consultants and organizational theorists the world over. Among the insights derived from this mantra are claims like, people are loyal to culture, not to strategy. Culture is more efficient than strategy. Advertising is a tax you pay for having an unremarkable culture. And culture provides greater discipline than disciplinary action does. Such insights appeal to management experts because they suggest that while a company's bottom line for the coming year will be determined by strategy, its bottom line for subsequent years will be determined by culture. In other words, a culture plan is in the long term more important than a strategic plan. This vividly demonstrates that culture isn't a static given phenomenon best seen by an external observer but a dynamic, intentional power shaped by the close attention of participants and reflecting their most profound but often unspoken commitments. While Niebuhr perceives the all-pervasive quality of culture as the way human beings shape and adapt to nature, and Drucker and his followers seek to enhance organizations by paying particular attention to the priority of culture over more generic strategy, culture has a second, more particular meaning, sometimes rendered in the term high culture. This notion of culture understands it as a largely separate reality from culture in general, representing the best and most aspirational aspects of human creation, notably fine art, performance art, and literature. Such an understanding is invariably controversial because its quality lies in the eye of the beholder and thus sometimes seems subjective and because its production and enjoyment tends to be restricted to a segment of the population and thus is often regarded as elitist. Nonetheless, such an understanding has its ardent proponents. In his Culture and the Death of God, Terry Eagleton describes how this perspective sits in the light of two significant developments, the skeptical scrutiny of postmodernism and the decline of Christendom. Eagleton offers a sustained argument about the definition, influence, and extent of culture and its role as a substitute for religion in the modern era. The story, as Eagleton lucidly tells it, goes like this. The Enlightenment sought to oust a barbarous, benighted faith in favor of a rational, civilized one. It tore into religion, but it did so as a child berates a parent. It resented the power of the church, particularly in the political sphere, but it never imagined being without religion, and it had few ideas about how society was to be conceived or controlled if religion were truly to leave the scene. Eagleton ridicules the confusion of those who couldn't live with religion but couldn't live without it. I don't happen to believe myself, but it is politically expedient that you should, is the catchphrase of thinkers supposedly devoted to the integrity of the intellect, he caustically observes. Meanwhile, the more rigorously rational the world becomes, the more arbitrary and unfathomable God becomes. At the same time, everything in society becomes explicable, but there is no longer any system of making actions legitimate or valid. Such pathos continues into the industrial era. 
Individualism is a divisive doctrine, inhospitable to corporate identity. Capitalism proves incapable of generating an organic ideology of its own, and so reverts to one imported from elsewhere, often an idealized bygone era. It requires values such as faith, truth, authority, and hierarchical order, but has no way of manufacturing them. And so, to the divining project of the centuries since the Enlightenment, filling God's large shoes with reason, art, culture, imagination, the nation, humanity, the state, the people, society, morality, or some such other specious surrogate. God is not quite dead, mortally sick perhaps, but capably delegating responsibility to one envoy or another, part of whose task is to convince men and women that there is no cause for alarm, that business will be conducted as usual despite the absence of the proprietor, and that the acting director is perfectly capable handling all inquiries. The anticlimax to this narrative is postmodernism. Postmodernism is too young to recall a time when there was, so it is alleged, truth, unity, totality, objectivity, universals, absolute values, stable identities, and rock solid foundations, and thus finds nothing disquieting in their apparent absence. It experiences no fragmentation since unity was an illusion all along. No false consciousness because no unequivocal truth. No shaking of the foundations since none there are to be dislodged. Truth and identity have not vanished. They never were. For modernism, the death of God is a trauma, a source of anguish as well as celebration. By contrast, postmodernism doesn't experience it at all. There is nothing missing, no tragedy. The postmodern subject is hard pressed to find enough depth and continuity in itself to be a suitable candidate for tragic self dispossession. You cannot give away a self you never had. There is nowhere for God to dwell, no starry heaven above, and no interior castle within. Eagleton accepts the twofold understanding of culture I've described already. On the one hand, as in Niebuhr's understanding, culture is a descriptive anthropological category describing value, language, symbol, kinship, heritage, and community in social habit and interaction. On the other hand, culture is a normative aesthetic term associated with the tastes of an elite notably found in the hope that art will prove to be humanity's salvation. Eagleton's central point is that religion was the force that united and harmonized these two senses of culture. Nothing else could, which is why being an atheist was harder than it appeared. Eagleton tells how in the 19th century, myth, art, and culture, and the greatest of these is culture, sought to become ersatz forms of religion. They were the means by which transcendent truths might be converted into the currency of common experience. Hovering in the background of this narrative, named but never explored, is the most pervasive alternative, nationalism. Eagleton identifies the issue thus. For a certain vein of romantic nationalism, the nation, like the Almighty himself, is sacred, autonomous, indivisible, without end or origin, the ground of being, the source of identity, the principle of human unity, a champion of the dispossessed, and a cause worth dying for. Eagleton points out, tantalizingly, how the prime current candidate for religion is sport, with its liturgical assemblies, sacred icons, revered traditions, and pantheon of heroes. Sport is also culture, understood as both common habit and elite artistry. This is how Eagleton assesses the contemporary scene, at least in the West. 
As the power of religion begins to fail, its various functions are redistributed like a precious legacy to those seeking to become its heirs. Scientific rationalism takes over its doctrinal certainties, while radical politics inherits its mission to transform the face of the earth. Culture, in the aesthetic sense, safeguards something of its spiritual depth. Indeed, most aesthetic ideas, creation, inspiration, unity, autonomy, symbol, epiphany, and so on, are really displaced fragments of theology. Signs which accomplish what they signify are known as poetry to aesthetics and as sacraments. To theology. Eagleton summarizes the similarity between art and religion by pointing out that both used to be matters of great public contention, but have withdrawn into the seclusion of private expression. This is what he says. Religion follows the trajectory of art and sexuality, those other two major constituents of what one might call the symbolic sphere. They too tend to pass out of public ownership into private hands as the modern age unfolds. The art which once praised God, flattered a patron, entertained a monarch, or celebrated the military exploits of the tribe is now for the most part a question of individual self-expression. Even if it is not confined to a garret, it does not typically conduct its business amidst the bustle of court, church, palace, or public square. At the same time, Protestantism finds God in the inmost recesses of the individual life. It is when artists, like bishops, are unlikely to be hanged that we can be sure that modernity has set in. They do not matter enough for that. H. Richard Niebuhr and Terry Eagleton give us the shape of our challenge. Faith and art need to accept that they are part of culture in a general sense, but they must not accept that they dwell simply in the private sphere of taste and expression. At a time when understandings of the human are shrinking, yet are more needed than ever, Art and religion have opportunities that they can take together in ways that they may not be able to access apart. I'm now going to look at two contemporary proposals for a renewal of faith and culture. The first comes from artist and theologian Makoto Fujimura. Fujimura advocates for a spirit of generosity that awaits genesis moments that have generative capacity. He laments what he regards as the two pollutants in the river of culture, over-commodification of art and utilitarian pragmatism. He describes how artists, horrified by the Holocaust and nuclear warfare, came to see themselves as secular prophets and priests with a call to speak the truth against the establishment. They isolated themselves from mainstream society and sought to shock people into perceiving the scandals of their era, producing an artistic via negativa, emphasizing what truth is not. But their work became more esoteric and elitist. Then art became conscripted into the culture wars as a frontline foot soldier defending freedom of expression against tradition and conformity. Much was swept away and most of what was left was commercialism, where creativity is given over to survival and the celebrity model of art prevails. Fujimura's diagnosis is bleak. Today, an artist cannot simply paint, a novelist cannot simply write, a pianist cannot simply play. Utilitarian pragmatism and commercialism so thoroughly pervade culture that without some shift in worldview and expectation, what we do as artists, the activities of the arts, 
will be neither sustainable nor generative. Reacting to the culture wars and the way they've weaponized the arts, particularly in the United States, Fujimura asserts culture is not a territory to be won or lost, but a resource we are called to steward with care. Culture is a garden to be cultivated. Recalling how T.S. Eliot, in his notes towards the definition of culture, maintained that culture may be described as that which makes life worth living, Fujimura calls on artists and their friends to see this as a genesis moment in which they can find a truly prophetic voice, acting not just for shock and self-aggrandizement, but for cultivation and common flourishing. Artists can become known instead as citizen artists who lead in society with their imagination and their work. Following Lewis Hyde and Wendell Berry, Fujimura perceives that art exists in two economies, the market and the gift economy, but that the latter is fundamental. He recalls how Native Americans in the Pacific Northwest regarded salmon as a gift, taking no more than was necessary and trusting stocks would replenish. When settlers came, salmon turned into a commodity, and in no time market forces jeopardized its survival. Art is like that salmon. In just the same way, it needs some protection from market forces to survive. Fujimura maintains it's not enough to have artists who seek after beauty, truth, and goodness. We must have churches, policies, and communities that promote a long-term nurture of culture that is beautiful, truthful, and full of goodness. He prefers the metaphor of garden to greenhouse, since the latter are sheltered, resource-intensive, and less vibrant. <clears throat> a garden has a better balance of wind and rain, yet within an enclosed space. Hence, Fujimura arrives at the key image of an estuary, where salt water mixes with fresh in a confluence of river and tidal waters. An estuary is an environment not of protection, but of preparation. He says estuaries are a critical nursery area, for example, for young salmon, striped bass, and other fish that come downstream after hatching. Life in semi-protected estuarial wetlands during a critical period in their development readies these fish for life in the ocean. Estuary's purpose is not so much protection as preparation. Each individual habitat strengthens its participants to interact with the wider environment, making for a diversity that is healthy enough for true competition. Fujimura sees artists as oysters, cleaning the water they inhabit, often turning pollutants into pearls, yet sometimes purifying the water at the cost of polluting themselves. Oysters are found in estuaries. He cites significant estuary periods in history, such as 16th century Japan, with the influx of Portuguese and Italian missionaries. Early 20th century New York, with many immigrants and influences from the American South, pre-Renaissance Europe, where Ottoman invasions brought Islamic and Asian stimuli, and the salons of 18th and 19th century Paris. Such estuaries come about today when three elements converge. The creative capital of an artist, the social capital of a pastor or community leader, and the material capital of finance or business. Fujimura maintains that a movement requires two of these to be sustainable, but all three to flourish. The difference is that while material capital is limited, creative and social capital are infinite. 
Creating cultural estuaries in churches, schools, and informal associations is his strategy for enhancing culture. A second proposal for the renewal of faith and culture comes from Rowan Williams. In his book, Grace and Necessity, Reflections on Art and Love, Williams provides a counterbalance to Makoto Fujimura. Drawing on the work of the mid-20th century French Roman Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain, Williams is careful to avoid a too hasty connection between art and morality, either as grounds or purpose. <clears throat> Maritain uh, follows Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle in distinguishing between making and doing. Doing is the right use of freedom for the sake of human good. Making is the production of a specific outcome in the material world, a product. To make well is not the same as to do well. Virtuous making aims not at the good of humanity, but at the good of what is made. Thomas Aquinas defines beauty as that which pleases when seen. A feature may be in itself jarring or even terrible, but may still be what pleases in its context. Beauty is not, therefore, a single transcendent object or source of truth. That is, it provides satisfaction, joy for the human subject, but it does not in itself tell you anything. Thus, there are three levels in the life of a finished work. First is integrity, the inner logic of a product. Next, proportion, its harmony and adaptation to the observer's mind. Then what Maritain calls splendor, the active drawing in of the observer's mind. Thus, beauty is a relation between work and observer in which the observer's will as well as intellect is engaged, a relation in which what is present to the mind is sensed as desirable, as a source of pleasure. But what Maritain is, I think, cautioning against is any suggestion that the sensation of being in the presence of the desirable gives you any information about how the world actually is or about what is humanly to be done about it. Given that the human will is spectacularly fallible and self-deceiving, a judgment of beauty cannot, as such, be morally or metaphysically illuminating. Williams adds that when we apprehend that something is not there solely for me, that it has an overplus of significance, this very fact has a metaphysical dimension. The gratuitous, disinterested character of the artifact means that awareness of beauty is a recognition of something beyond the merely functional in a work. But crucially, the production of beauty cannot be a goal for the artist. If the artist sets out to please, it will compromise the end product. Nonetheless, if it is well and honestly made, it will exhibit that overflow of presence which generates joy. Yet Maritain accepts that beauty is always incomplete, limping like Jacob after tussling with the angel. He speaks of that kind of imperfection through which infinity wounds the finite. It's time to review what we've learned from the two senses of culture and the two proposals and suggest a theological vision for the arts. Here are four proposals. First, the church is a work of art. God is the artist who makes the church through the action of the Holy Spirit in the form of Christ out of the material of human beings. As Williams points out, finitude means that all works of art are incomplete. The church without question evidences that kind of imperfection through which infinity wounds the finite. 
The church is not beautiful in a detached, distant sense, but if and when it is well and honestly made, it exhibits that overflow of presence which generates joy. The church has exactly that overplus or surfeit of significance to which Williams alludes. It has that beauty derived from a recognition of something beyond the merely functional in its life and flourishing. And yet those who seek to build up the church, those who bless the church without being desirous or feeling worthy to be its members, and the Holy Spirit who draws diverse people into its life, are all seeking something other than beauty, more likely the word of truth or the gesture of goodness, rather than beauty itself. No one is setting out to look fine or noble or elegant, but in aiming to be true and striving to be good, their labors can sometimes, perhaps most often in retrospect, and often in the context of failure, be appropriately described as beautiful. The words of Ephesians 2 verse 10, translated blandly in the NRSV as we are what God has made us, sometimes God's workmanship, could more imaginatively be rendered we are God's work of art, or perhaps better, God's poem. It's against the grain of the New Testament to assume that we means an assortment of individuals. We means the church, and the whole of Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 10 is about the lengths to which God has gone to make the church a companion forever. Thus the church isn't initially a community that, makes, that does or makes things, or even an environment that enables and encourages things to be done and made. It's fundamentally a thing that has been made an artifact, the fruit of Christ's labors and the constant activity of the Holy Spirit. As Christ made the fourth rail bridge by laying down his life, so the Holy Spirit continues daily to paint it and maintain it that the world can cross it. But the wonder of crossing it and the spectacle of beholding it mean that a structure built for a specific purpose is now regarded just as much as a thing of beauty. What this means for the church is that art isn't an instrumental thing, a good way of getting the message across in a visual age, but a celebration and imitation of the way the church is itself a work of art. Thus art is a sacrament a tangible item or practice that honors, echoes, and replicates a truth embodied in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Art isn't always simply beautiful, just as not all actions of Christ are simply beautiful, but art in myriad ways recalls and reproduces the prophetic, priestly, and kingly ministries of Jesus. Second, following Eagleton, the church can once again be a place that unites and harmonizes the two senses of culture, the anthropological and the aesthetic, culture as social habit and interaction, and culture as creation, inspiration, and epiphany. The church long ago gave up the claim to be the place of unity and harmony. Such an accolade is not its own to bestow, but it can nonetheless seek to be a place, indeed an exemplary such place. Church means, in popular speech, almost equally a sacred space where people gather to pray and find sanctuary, and at the same time the people who gather there, an institution with visible leaders, active participants, and fringe adherents. It is thus a place and a people. The place is one in which art can be displayed, song can be sung, dance and drama performed. The people are ones who collectively and individually host, encourage, and respond to these arts and offer fertile soil in which artistic culture interacts with social culture. 
but in Eagleton's sense, as a meeting point of the anthropological and the aesthetic, church may also have a third meaning, as a verb, or at least an adverb, a how and not just a what, a way of configuring dialogue and fermenting debate, of fostering awe and inviting response, of seeing patiently and listening carefully, of tempering instant reaction and cultivating generous reception. If the first assertion was that the church was God's work of art, this second assertion is that the church is like a parable. A parable is an image, story, or parody, a mirror, or a challenge, which follows the logic of God and discloses the outcomes of that logic in startling and vivid ways. A parable portrays the surprise, reversal, delight, consternation, and revelation of God's grace and mercy, judgment, and truth. Along the way, it has a variety of characters who take up roles in representing God's ways. A parable is not a fable with a moral <clears throat> after the manner of Aesop. Neither is it a device for communicating a proposition that could be succinctly expressed in other ways. It is an invitation to enter God's upside-down kingdom and perceive the action and character of God in the midst of human fragility, fear, and folly. The church is precisely that, the living out of an alternative story, the logical outworking of a rival truth the daily and weekly rehearsing of a different method, results, and conclusion. It is not just a work of art, but a gallery of alternative lives, intriguing plots, compelling suggestions. If the church is a public parable, singing a different song, it cannot content itself with the role of commentator or peripheral observer. It's not enough to call on government to do more, corporations to be more righteous, celebrities to be better role models, institutions to live more honorably. It's not prophetic to call others continually to change. The church must exhibit the change it wants others to make. It must be a living alternative. It must embody the generosity it seeks offer the wisdom it demands, celebrate the new order it proclaims. It must be a parable, not just tell one. Third, Fujimura's image of an estuary offers a humble but intriguing reassessment of what the church thinks it's doing. One might say the church has long assumed it was the sea to which every river led or it might be said to have identified with the pure water of the river in contrast with the salty water of the sea. But the image of an estuary is helpful for a church regarding itself as a meeting place of human and divine, gospel and culture, timeless truth and embodied experience, word and world. Church means the spirit-empowered intersection of human and divine, incarnate in Jesus, now continuing beyond his ascension. It means local communities of disciples worshiping, sharing, growing, walking in faith and hope, and it means those institutional structures that facilitate both of the above. But it also, in the great majority of cases, means a building. And very often that building has a significance in a neighborhood, sometimes beyond that neighborhood, that exceeds its purpose as a gathering place for the faithful. For this reason, the metaphor of a transitional place where cross-fertilization can take place and creativity can thrive amid diverse conversation partners may be apt. Churches work hard to make themselves inspiring locations where people are drawn into a sense of the presence of God. But they can work equally hard to make themselves hospitable locations where people of varied backgrounds may gather in a spirit 
of mutual appreciation, generous regard, and constructive challenge. The two purposes of church need not be mutually exclusive. Art is a perfect example of how such an estuary space may flourish. A congregation may encourage art on three levels. One is the participatory. A local church may host an artists and craftspeople's group. It may take participants of all abilities. There's no reason why it can't host members of all faiths and none. Perhaps each month a member of the group may be invited to exhibit their work in a valued and visible place and be given the opportunity to write or speak about it. Another is the aspirational. A competition might be held for an artifact to be placed permanently in the church building. Tenders invited, donors sought, publicity encouraged, visitors attracted. Similar approaches might apply for temporary art installations. A third level is the commercial. A church building might be a suitable venue for a display and sale of artworks. Yet another host of new faces drawn in, conversations triggered, relationships made, and the church perhaps taking a 20% cut of all pieces sold. In a short time, a secluded, secretive space may be opened out to become a center of community activity, energy, and creativity. Much the same principles and categories would apply for choral music or drama or literature. What's needed is for a church to let go of the need for direct outcomes and linear trajectories and to let the Holy Spirit govern the interactions and catalyze its own surprises. Fourth, following Drucker and Williams, the church's unique ability should be to be a culture free from anxiety. What a thought. If sin and hurt have been healed by the forgiveness of sins, and if terror and horror have been displaced by the promise of everlasting life, the church does not have to be locked into the conventional measurements of papering over its mistakes and managing its future. The culture of the church should be one that has time to be hospitable because it's God's time, has eagerness to listen because it's God's truth, is open to the stranger because thus we entertain God's angels, is unafraid to embark on faithful experiments because God determines the outcome, and is glad to play, because all it needs to do is to imitate the joy of God's kingdom. <coughs> the culture that eats strategy for breakfast is the culture made possible by forgiveness and eternal life. Thus, as Williams, following Maritain, puts it, the production of beauty is not the church's goal. If the church sets out to please, it will compromise the end product. Yet if it lives well and honestly, it will indeed exhibit that overflow of presence which generates joy. The church models art by allowing its beauty to be ancillary. It is seeking something even deeper and richer than beauty. But if it finds what it's looking for, it will be able to look back and see that its root there was beautiful. The church's engagement in culture is not to instrumentalize culture in order to communicate a detachable message, nor to suppose culture can replace religion as the sum of human aspiration, nor yet to assume that all truth lies within ourselves and enabling it to be expressed is the only way to let that truth speak. It is to become through the possibilities, imagination, and relationships art makes possible, a culture that evinces infectious generosity and irrepressible creativity, exciting and inspiring people to perceive and embody the kingdom of God. When a management guru says advertising is a tax you pay for having an unremarkable culture, the hope is that such a marketing expert would look at a church that had truly embraced the possibility of culture and say, see, that's exactly what I mean. In the end, if church is advert, not noun, it does not have a culture, 
It is a culture. In conclusion, I want to describe how this fourfold vision of artwork, parable, estuary, and culture might take shape. Because of the perpetual concern of elitism, I'm going to tell a story from a humble's place, yet a place where all four of these dimensions were significant. For the six years either side of the millennium, I was vicar of a parish in Norwich. Norwich is known for its ancient city centre with its countless medieval churches. But this parish was a 1930s council estate three miles to the west. Six years before I arrived, the diocese had built a very modern church to replace the dilapidated hall that previously housed Christian worship at the heart of the estate. From the outset, the new building suffered relentless vandalism. Once I was asked by a teenage girl, are you the new vicar? I said, I've been here about three years. I used to know the old vicar, she replied. I used to throw stones at his windows. Why was that, I asked, genuinely interested. Oh, you see, she said matter-of-factly, I don't believe in God. In fact, the stone throwing wasn't limited to the building, but sometimes extended to the congregation as they left worship. There were times in my first year or two when the evening service felt like a siege. The 20 ground floor windows were replaced by protected perspex, and a daunting iron gate prevented people gathering to drink in the open porch. The congregation and I got busy. We hosted countless community activities, often at little or no rent. We opened up the church to a youth club for up to 50 young people at a time. We invited school children to make huge 30-foot long paper murals to put on the walls representing the different seasons of the church year. We gave cameras to single mothers to photograph local characters and display their pictures and words around the sanctuary. We had a huge dance troupe that rehearsed and performed constantly. We joined local committees and trustees seeking to improve the neighborhood together. We ran after school and holiday clubs until we were worn out. The name of the church was St. Elizabeth's. Quickly I came to identify with this figure from Luke's gospel like never before. Elizabeth was old. <clears throat> As Genesis says of Sarah, it had ceased to be with her after the manner of women. Nothing more was expected of her life. Likewise, the housing estate was around 65 years old, and no one inside or out looked to it with any degree of expectation. Yet our daily prayer was that this church and this estate would be blessed and become a blessing to others. <clears throat> As any new minister knows, one of the things you have to do before accepting a job is to look over the church accounts because they'll tell you a story no one will convey face to face. And so it was I discovered the existence of a fund called stained glass windows. It seemed the last thing in the world the church needed. It turned out it was a fund left over from the old hall intended to make the building look more like a church. But three years after I came, we did an extraordinary thing. In two four-by-four-foot windows, only three foot from the ground, we put a stained-glass depiction of the meeting of Mary and Elizabeth. In the left window was Mary, young, overwhelmed, yet full of joy. In the right window was Elizabeth, old, forsaken, weighed down by the world, yet astonished and filled with the Holy Spirit, and exclaiming with a loud cry, Why has this happened to me? At just the very moment, the child in her womb leaps for joy. <clears throat> None of us could quite believe that in the very place where countless windows had been smashed just four or five years before, we were now inserting such glorious stained glass windows that spoke to the apparently God-forsaken nature of the estate, and yet the youthfulness of many who lived there and anticipated the blessing that God would bring to the whole community. 
A year later, inspired by the success of the windows, we set about taking down the iron gates. More than anything else, those gates were a symbol of how frightened the congregation had become of those who so often expressed their antagonism in violent ways. The gates were transported to what was then called the Norwich School of Art, and a young woman, not much older than the Mary of Luke's birth narrative, began a long process of transforming these oppressive railings into an extraordinary 40-foot-wide wing an awesome and breathtaking symbol of the Holy Spirit, which almost entirely filled the space above the entrance to the sanctuary of the church. It was the most remarkable turning of a sword into a plowshare I've ever seen. <clears throat> the effect on the congregation was as awesome as these two extraordinary works of art. The windows made us believe that despite adversity and hostility, we really did belong in this community and we really did have a gospel that spoke to the heart of the community's story. And the wing inspired us to trust that what was going to happen would not depend on our strength, but that waiting on the Lord, we would mount up with wings like eagles. We would run and not be weary. We would walk and not faint. This experience for me encapsulated the paradox of the incarnation. On the one hand, it was too ordinary, Everyone knows the jokes about Norwich, the graveyard of ambition, a town in decline since the 14th century, whose doctors take a quick assessment of the state of mind of their presenting patients and write above the bed the letters NFN, normal for Norfolk. Here was a neighborhood so behind the times that 20 years after the Thatcher government's right to buy scheme, 90% of the houses were still council owned. This was a community apparently summed up by Nathaniel, Nathaniel's words in John's Gospel, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I remember walking out of the vicarage and seeing a boy kicking a football against the church and saying, can I ask why you'd want to do that? This is your church and your community. I can understand why you'd kick a ball at another church in another neighborhood, but why destroy what belongs to you? just too ordinary, too flawed, too painfully human. But here was an incarnate church communicating in practical gestures and open heart that God cared about what people cared about. Here was this depiction of a babe in the womb leaping for joy, a whole community rising up on eagle's wings, a glimpse of the wondrous and eternal in the midst of despondency and doldrums. It was just too extraordinary. It was saying what, just exactly what the first chapter of Luke's Gospel is saying, which is that God does the most extraordinary things through the most ordinary people. God chooses an obscure part of the Roman province of Syria, a town of Nazareth, to begin the most extraordinary story of all. God puts an underage, unmarried girl together with an overage, exhausted woman to make the setting for an exhilarating declaration. God is turning the ordinary texture of human existence into the astonishing glory of divine essence. Jesus is at the same time totally and utterly ordinary and astoundingly and gloriously extraordinary. In my office, I keep on my bookshelf framed photographs of those two stained glass windows, Mary and Elizabeth, as a constant reminder of how God does the extraordinary through the most ordinary. They ask me Elizabeth's perpetual and ambiguous question, why has this happened to me? One day, just a few years ago, I got a parcel from Norwich with a framed photograph inside. It was a, sta a third stained glass image that 15 years later had been placed in the window beside the first two. The image depicts St. Anne, the apocryphal mother of Mary, grandmother of Jesus, aunt of Elizabeth, by the same artist in just the same style. I carefully placed Anne beside Mary and Elizabeth on my bookshelf. I remembered that community, all our failures and successes, most of all those projects that opened heaven to earth and lifted us up on eagle's wings. 
and I thought, God is faithful. God is still becoming extraordinarily divine in human flesh. This is what true beauty looks like. This is incarnation, Jesus being born. Here we see each dimension of our vision for church and the arts. This was the church as a work of art, not a thing of beauty, but a canvas onto which the Holy Spirit was painting a previously unknown image. This was the church as a parable of crucifixion yielding resurrection. This was the church as estuary, where taking the risk of opening the building to a kaleidoscope of community events eventually led to perceiving the pearl in the oyster of the stained glass and the huge sculpture. And this finally was church as culture, thrilling as the two artifacts were. The key was that church and neighborhood found a common point that exceeded the previous best efforts of either of them and found peace and celebration in the beautiful things that became possible when they were able to work together. That is what opening a church's soul to the possibilities of culture can do. Thank you. Silence, but um, the tradition is to have some uh, some opportunities for questions. Um, Sam, that was just quite wonderful. Um, some phrases that I think just uh, really struck me as so incredibly powerful. The the overflow of presence that generates joy, and I think we've all kind of seen that in in what you've presented tonight, the, the infinity wounding the finite. And we think of Jacob with his wound. Um, there's a great Presbyterian minister, Frederick Beekner, who says, what did Jacob see? And he saw a face half ruined by suffering and fierce with joy. And that's, I think, what we get close to with great art. There's a Jewish word that I just also thought of when I was listening, and it's a word called hizuk, which is a wound in the skin, but it's also a shot in the arm. And I think that's a wonderful kind of juxtaposition. So thank you. And I think someone will be lurking with a microphone. Roy has got the microphone there. Do we have any questions from Maybe also from the internet. Maybe also from the internet. Do they come in from the internet? Yeah. I asked last night why there were no questions from the internet, and somebody who I think is here now said that was because at seven o'clock it was Bake Off. <laughs> I better go. <laughs> yeah. You know, we don't have to push it if um, if there are no. I don't. Yeah. There is one here. Yeah. Thank you again. Uh, very interesting and again thought provoking. Um, I just think when you are just now saying opening the church, as you say, with all the. Com um, community activities and bringing the people in I think it's lovely and it's it's trying to actually solve I think some of the problems in society at present which is loneliness and um, lack of uh, comfort amongst people so I think actually as I was saying to you earlier some of this could go beyond the church the church could go outside and maybe participate in other events or bridge up with other religious bodies. 
Is that something that you see chimes with what you, so I'm thinking of synagogues and, you know, uh, mosques or other similar religious bodies which could have the same message going out that we are actually trying to revive a sense of beauty from within the people? Thank you. Um, I, I, I found, you know, I, I, I pointed out one or two criticisms of Fujimura, but I think Fujimura's image of the estuary is incredibly suggestive. Uh, that's why I, I think he gave you three pictures of estuaries taken. Uh, of course, I didn't take them myself from, you know, uh, several thousand feet up in the sky. Uh, but there's no reason why another, it's not a theological image, an estuary, there's no Christian copyright on that image at all. It's, it's in a sense, the question when uh, approaching a synagogue or a university uh, is, we, we see ourselves increasingly as an estuary where, where different cultures can, can overflow and meet and where things like oysters can grow that don't grow in either of the salt water or the, the clear water. Do you see yourself as an estuary too? Uh, it, it's not a thing you can simply say a knee-jerk yes to because, um, well, let's just say one of my slogans is there's nothing as conservative as a liberal church. Um, it, it has only been in the last nine months that St. Martin the Fields has been happy to, mit, to, to let people drink wine in the sanctuary. You know, this is the church that had no problem ent entertaining the money changers in the temple downstairs for the last 30 years, but the idea we might drink wine in a church, what an extraordinary idea. No sense of irony from anybody over the last 30 years about the idea of drinking wine in a church. Um, we are now happy in the last nine, nine months for people to, to bring wine upstairs during concerts and, and drink. You know, so, so what I'm saying is that uh, even in a place that is practically identical with the kingdom of God, like St. Martin the Fields, as I think people here are well aware, um, there can be thresholds of hospitality that people still keep as unconscious barriers. So to say, are you prepared to be an estuary, is, is to say, are you prepared that people are going to come into this place that don't see it as a sacred place and don't necessarily honor it as a sacred place, but bring their own gifts as the angels that you entertain unawares? And a synagogue will have to go through its own thresholds about a thing, thing like that, and other religious buildings of other faiths will have to do the same. And other, other institutions have their own rights and wrongs, which may seem opaque and mysterious to outsiders, just as that curious ban on drinking wine in a place where the key act of worship is about drinking wine, um, you know, seems opaque to, other, to outsiders about St. Martin's. So, so yes, I, I, I absolutely think, I mean, and again, you could say that my lecture last night was about compassion, most obviously thought of as mission, largely about what the church should be involved in well beyond its, its conventional boundaries of buildings and, uh, and, understand, and, and faith and so on. Whereas tonight I've been talking particularly about art, particularly in relation to church buildings, just because they are such an underused asset and a gift to a community. Uh, but there's no reason why art can't become part of that mission, as you've described. Another couple of questions here. This is not altogether a serious question, but what are your views on the helter skelter that was in Norwich Cathedral? Well, if I was a church diplomat, I would say, of course, it's not my business to comment on individuals. Um, I, I understand, and I've, I've written elsewhere, about three kinds of art. That's to say, the pr prophetic kind of art that Fujimura talks about, you know, quite eloquently by locating it in history 
as a kind of art that in often intends to shock and to shock us into a new consciousness. Uh, Tracy Emin's work in Liverpool Cathedral would be an obvious example. Um, sometimes it sort of seems to go too far or shocks just for effect without any real purpose. Uh, but at other times, it, it really awake, awakens us to a new consciousness and to repentance. Uh, the second kind would be priestly art, which, which folds into worship. Uh, and the, you know, so a, a, an organ voluntary, for example, would be a form of that kind of priestly art. Um, and the third kind would be kingly art, which is, you know, a celebration of creation, the, the architecture of a place like St. John's, uh, on Lothian Road would be, a, an, and, and some of the, the art we saw inside St. Cuthbert's, those of us who are at St. Cuthbert's today, would be examples of that kind of kingly art that has a, a wonderful create, you know, beauty that rejoices in creation but can look a little bit complacent and establishment if seen from a, you know, a, a marginal perspective. I wouldn't really regard on the face of it, albeit being an outsider, knowing Norwich Cathedral very well, but not knowing the background of the Helter Skelter, um, I wouldn't see that as necessarily a form of any of those kinds of art. Uh, now, to say I don't see it as a form of art is not to say it's, it can't be part of a, uh, you know, a playful rejoicing in, uh, in all kinds of ways, you know, metaphorical of the, uh, of the Tower of Babel or, you know, a, a hundred different kind of possible interpretations. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say art and culture would be the, the lens through which I'd, I'd see an endeavor like that. Um, I, if, if it's an attempt to, to open the, the cathedral and to make the people of Norwich feel it's their cathedral, they can come, they can play, they can be childlike in the place, um, then I, I'm not, I'm not cr criticizing it. I just wouldn't see it as within the kind of penumbra of the things that we're talking about in this notion of culture tonight. Thank you very much. Um, are there times when art and culture are um, unhelpful in uh, proclaiming the gospel. I'm thinking really of the art of some of the sectarian um, images in the north of Ireland, for example. Um, when I used to work at Coventry Cathedral, we had a, 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 an artistic display um, of some of the um, Derry, London Derry um, images on the, on, the, on, the, on the gable ends of, of the terraces. Um, some people uh, uh, thought that was um, unhelpful and other people thought it was helpful. I uh, just wondered what you've got to, got to say about that sort of um, art and culture. Yes, I, 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 I'd slightly hesitate over the term you used about in proclaiming the gospel because I was, you know, one theme I came back to three or four times in the presentation this evening was was not to instrumentalize art even in such a good purpose as proclaiming the gospel. I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not against proclaiming the gospel, but I think to see art's primary purpose as a commodity to be used in that larger purpose is to undersell art. I mean, there's something about this notion of an estuary which means relaxing control of how people will interpret the art. You know, it's, it's not a, a sweetie thing just to be beautiful. I hope I made that point very clearly over and over again, perhaps. Um, but it's, it needs to be said. But also, it's not simply a means to an end, even an, as noble an end as, as communicating the gospel. But to go to your material point about the sectarian uh, representations of par paramilitaries and of orange orders and of uh, equivalent nationalist and Catholic images... Well, um, I'm not going to answer that question head on, but I am going to, I, I don't know if you know um, uh, a piece of music that's based on the deer's cry that starts, I arise today. Some people here will know it. If you're kind of into the Celtic stuff, you'll almost certainly know it. And the president of Ireland had it sung at his... Um, Inauguration, which was a very Michael Higgins, which was a very moving moment, and you can see it on YouTube. 
but not now, you're listening to me. Um, but do watch it on YouTube because it's, it's a very moving moment. And in the, second, um, in the second verse of that piece, the deer's cry, which culminates in the Patrick's breastplate, Christ within me and so on, that people will be very familiar with. Um, uh, so it starts, I, will, I rise today in the strength of heaven. Um, and then it moves on to talk about how you know, how the breastplate protects me and how the strength, you know, the strength that I gain from being a child of God. Uh, and then there's a, there's a line within that that um, says, from, from all who will mean me ill, afar and anear. And there's one version on YouTube because at a time when I was going to be using this, a piece of music in a, in a presentation, I you know, Googled a few different YouTube versions, which represents uh, pictorially each line of that. And it's, it's worth a look. It's one of, you know, YouTube gives you an awful lot of good things and not so good things, but that's one of the more beautiful things I think I've seen on YouTube, the, the setting of that, of that song with accompanying images. And, you know, you might want to use it for devotional purposes for your own congregations. Uh, I would say that those gable ends would be very appropriate images for the lines for all that would mean me ill, afar and anear. And provided you provide, you, you offer both the nationalist and the loyalist images, and you're not sort of taking sides, um, that's where I would locate them. So I wouldn't say uh, those sorts of images are proclaiming the gospel but they are certainly helpful in understanding how, and I, I'm going to, you know, I'm saying difficult things here, I recognize that, um, but how certain aspects of a community's deep culture can distort that community and distort the gospel. And we need to know that because... Northern Ireland is not the only part of the United Kingdom, and by that I mean all four parts of the United Kingdom, where nationalism can be mistaken for the gospel. What's the most beautiful piece of art you've seen in a sacred space recently, and why was it beautiful to you? Uh, well, if we can, um, if I'm allowed, uh, uh, that was Derek's voice, but I don't know where Derek is, but it's an unmistakable voice. <laughs> so, um, uh, if I'm allowed to answer that question uh, in the broad sense of art, then I would say one of the things I'm proudest of about St. Martin the Fields uh, in the last few years is that every Palm Sunday, Richard Carter, the associate vicar for mission, produces and directs a passion play. And in that passion play in recent years, most of the parts of the disciples have been played by members of our asylum seeker group um, and have, you know, have, if you like, followed Jesus by the most extraordinary paths to Jerusalem you know, several of them in boats across the Mediterranean uh, and so on, uh, and have got the most amazing stories to tell, some of them, you know, very, very sad ones. Um, the parts of the Sanhedrin have been played by white males wearing pinstripe suits, uh, dressed as people in the city or the, the temple law courts uh, would be dressed. Um, on one occasion, uh, the part of Jesus was played by a wheelchair user. Uh, on another occasion, by uh, a recently given right to remain uh, Afghan member of the congregation and community. Um, on more than one occasion, Jesus' scourging has been, uh, once it was done with palm fronds, but in the last couple of years, it's been done by 
waterboarding Jesus, uh, not figuratively, but, but literally, in a bucket. Um, on a couple of recent occasions, the part of Pilate has been played by somebody with a New York accent and a large hairpiece going in the pulpit and saying, what is truth? And those, um, I have to say, those uh, performances have moved me and I think the whole community as much as any piece of art I can remember. So to feel that I can be part of a community and I, I'm not you know, the person close, most closely involved with the Asylum Seeker Ministry, I haven't directed the play, um, I know all the members of the cast, um, but to feel that I can be part of a community that can portray the passion narrative with, um, you know, with a, you know, which I'm sure everybody here knows like the back of their hand in a way that feels like you've never heard it before and shocks you and moves you and uh, makes everybody emotional and yet convicted and empowered. Um, you know, it's something I'm very proud of. So I would say that would be the piece of art that, um, that has most struck me in the last few years and repeatedly by non-identical repetition over the last seven years that I've been the vicar at St. Martin's. supper. <laughs> uh, are there any other questions or? Do you want the other microphone? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this is a, an answerable question. But I'm, I'm very inspired by your vision for the, the church with artwork, parable, estuary and culture. Um, it seems to me they're obviously very inter intertwined, but in, in terms of how you, uh, in terms of the, the practical use of, of how you would then begin to help churches to engage with this, sort of where do you start? You know, you've put them in that order, it's culture of a foundation, and I don't know if I, this is something that would link to your work in Elsham, but I'm just int intrigued by the, the sort of relationship between the, those four and, and how, they, how that plays out. Well, I, 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 I feel a bit of a broken record, but I, I learned that the skill of communication is not to be shy of saying the same thing over and over again. So I'll say something I've said in the Q&A after some of the other lectures, which is you can't overvalue the, the virtue of humility. That's to say, if the church is letting you down, invest in the kingdom. And what that means in practice is if you're a pastor who's looking out at 12 people in your congregation and you're thinking, I don't know if this is sustainable and this magnificent sermon I've spent all of Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday preparing is not probably going to galvanize this group of 12 people to go out and transform the world. Um, then just have a look at what the community is longing to offer you. I mean, it's true, I think Rowan Williams and Jacques Maritain are right to say there's a lot more to art than its personal self-expression and creativity, but that's not a bad place to start. So let's imagine, as I was in, in Earlham, you're serving a parish of... 5,000 odd people, I can't remember how many people lived in the parish, but let's take that as a figure. Um, some of whom went to the Methodist church and some to the Catholics, okay, I'll grant that. So, but, and they were, of course, blissfully happy and on the road to salvation, so I didn't have to worry about them. Um, but let's say that leaves you with, with 4,920. Um, I assume that every single one of those has a creative spark within them which is longing to surface in everything that creativity can do. And you don't need me to tell you what creativity can do. Creativity inspires yourself, 
enlivens every pore of your being, makes you feel alive like never before, gives you the affirmation of appreciation from other people, gives you the opportunity to share your joy with others. I mean, the list just goes on and on of what creativity can do. And if you assume not only that all those 4,920 people have that within them, but have almost inevitably been crushed by a teacher or a sibling or a parent or a neighbor to make them think they can't sing or they can't draw or they can't this, that, and the other. And therefore, any tentative attempt to express this spark within them is shrouded around and circumscribed by those voices that have been put in their head, some of which are their own, of self-doubt and self-rejection. And that the most liberating experience that most of us can regularly feel outside transcendent moments of bliss that you know, may come along from time to time is that sense of breaking through the doubt and the frustration and the isolation of suppressing those gifts and breaking through that and coming to a point of tentative offering of a, of a meager creation, whether that's the cooking of a meal or the painting or drawing of a small um, image. And, and, and that the feeling where that has been received, like Abel's gift was received by God in, in Genesis chapter 4 that Cain so despised and envied, um, if that is the most wonderful regular experience we can have, and we've got 12 people in our congregation and you know, preaching a sermon to keep them happy and doing the pastoral care for them doesn't take you much more than an hour or two on Monday morning and you've got the rest of the week to play with, then why not spend the rest of the week making yourself and your congregation people who are dying to receive the glories that the whole of the population is dying to offer? Full stop. Just do it in any possible way you can. Use your building. You do it. You know, come into people's homes. Offer a competition. Any old how doesn't matter how. Just do it. I think we'll draw to a close there. But maybe I can just use this moment to say a wee plug. <laughs> Crossreach, which many of you will know, but some of you may not have heard of, is the social care arm of the Church of Scotland. They set up a project a few years ago called Heart for Art. And we host a Heart for Art project at the Greyfriars Chartres Centre. It's art therapy for people living with dementia. And it is incredibly transformative. And I would commend any of you here to imagine and think about the possibility of doing that in your place. Because there are so many people who are struggling and living with dementia uh, in our country today. But thank you for what has been just a, a, a wonderful uh, experience tonight, Sam. Um, I think this has just been terrific and um, these whole lecture series have been absolutely fantastic. And so uh, in the usual way, could we just Give Sam a round of applause and say thank you very much for another stimulus. <laughs>